In this lecture, we're going to be looking at Luther and the Thunderstorm. And the issue of Luther and the Thunderstorm is not simply the story of how Luther decided to abandon law school and to turn against his father's wishes and to join a monastery. But rather, it's the entire context of what Luther thought he was doing when he was joining the monastery. And beyond that, we want to look at some of the issues of what Luther was stepping into in terms of relationships, in terms of education, who were the Augustinian friars whom Luther was joining. And we can begin just simply with the story itself. In 1505, Luther had finished his bachelor's and his master's of arts, laying the foundation for his overall education and providing him now the opportunity to take the next step in terms of his education. And there are lots of ways in medieval education that you could do this. After the bachelor's and the master's, you could pursue medicine, theology, philosophy, and law. These were considered to be the supreme subjects, and theology, above all, was the queen of the sciences, as it was known, meaning it was the supreme subject to be studied. Well, for whatever reason, despite the fact that Luther had promised to go to law school and had enrolled and was beginning his studies, he'd bought his books and all these kinds of things, Suddenly, he withdrew from the University of Erfurt for the study of law, and he entered the Augustinian monastery there in the city. And Luther later says that the spark of what drove him into the monastery was actually an experience he had in a thunderstorm. Riding on horseback from his parents' house, heading to law school, Luther says that on the 2nd of June, 1505, Luther, while on the road, was caught up in the midst of a thunderstorm. And he doesn't really embroider the story very much, but he does say that the storm and the lightning was crashing near enough to him that he feared for his life. And there are all kinds of medieval assumptions about this. The biggest one, the most important one, is that in the medieval world, it was believed that if someone was struck down by a sudden death, in this case, if Luther had been hit by lightning and had perished, it was seen somehow as a direct judgment by God. To die suddenly like this was proof that the Lord was angry with this person. And so there is certainly enough in the culture of the medieval world that Luther is a part of for him to be fearful for his life and to sense in this thunderstorm the judgment of God. And the story he tells is that during the midst of the thunderstorm, crying out for his life, he prays to a saint, St. Anne. St. Anne is said to be the mother of the Virgin Mary though she is not named Anne of the Scriptures. We don't actually have her name according to Scriptures. But according to tradition, her name was Anne, and Luther calls on her to intervene for him. Again, very much a medieval act, calling on the saints to be an intercessor between you and the Lord is very much part of the fabric of Catholic Christian life. And he calls out to St. Anne. He says, St. Anne, I will become a monk. This is, in a manner of speaking, a last-ditch effort, saying, if you save me, if you get me out of this, then I will devote my life to prayer and fasting and to the life of the monastic. And all the way up until his excommunication and eventually his renunciation of his monastic vows, Luther saw this vow as ironclad, and any medieval person would. You vow to a saint that you'll do something, in this case, if his life is spared, and it was, then that vow is now permanent, and Luther took it quite seriously. Now, historians have noted that there might be a bit of duplicity here. It's hard to say. Luther doesn't quite tell us. But people have noted that St. Anne was actually the patron saint of copper miners, of miners in general. Now, of course, in the Middle Ages, saints were assigned to all kinds of professions and walks of life and needs of the Christian along the journey of life. And in this case, Anne was said to oversee the plight of miners. So there does seem to be a bit of a jab at Luther's father, at least, or at least a twisting of his arm. If he tells his father that he has sworn to St. Anne that he'll become a monk, well, his father, in the mining business himself, certainly doesn't want to cross the saint who is said to oversee his industry. Not everyone, though, believed Luther in the context of the immediacy of his desire to become a monk. Luther's father was, frankly, quite angry about this. Though, as we said in a previous lecture, he wasn't so angry that he stayed angry forever. He eventually came to terms with his son's decision. But he was angry that 
Luther had left him out of the decision, that he had decided this seemingly on a whim, that he had withdrawn from school, and that he had sold his books as fast as possible, and that he had joined the monastery and only really notified his father of this after the fact. One of Luther's friends actually, similarly, sort of scratched his head about this. Luther suddenly, on his way to law school, rising up the ranks of civil service, suddenly enters the monastery. And the friend thought that one of the things that could have been influencing Luther was that just prior to the thunderstorm experience, two of their closest friends had died. And you get the sense from this story from Luther's friend that they all took it quite hard, that maybe the carefree days of youth were beginning to sort of fade, and Luther, as he's entering into his mid-twenties, is beginning to wonder about the state of his soul, particularly after the death of two close friends. Unfortunately, the context of this story and the importance of it and Luther's mind at the time of this incident are almost impossible to penetrate. And Luther's mind and all that he ever really said for the remainder of his life was that he swore to St. Anne and he joined the monastery. The night before he entered the monastery, he had dinner with his friends and then he walked to the gate of the cloister. And then as he entered, he said to his friends, this day you see me and then never again. And you have to get the sense of this. In the Middle Ages, to join the monastery was not simply to join just any old profession. And in particular, as we'll say in a minute, the Augustinian order was particularly observant of the rules. They were not lax, in other words, as to the rules of the order of being a monk in their order. And for all intents and purposes, Luther was now leaving the world. You don't go on furlough as a monk. (laughs) You don't get to go on shore leave and get to go see your friends and have a few parties and a few laughs and then head back to the monastery. To become a monk was to cut oneself off from the world and the pleasures and the joys that you had known on the outside world. Now, monasticism also fits very squarely within the medieval understanding of salvation. As we talked about in a previous lecture, the process of the circle of life, you might even say, or the circle of sin, confession, absolution, penance, and then a restoration to the state of grace, this circle, this cycle of the Christian walk was achievable, certainly, by the lay life. But it was taught widely in the Middle Ages that those who questioned or doubted their soul's ability to do their penance and to grasp hold of the works of Christ, that if one feels this doubt or this compunction, that perhaps they're feeling a call to the monastery. And the monastic life is, in a manner of speaking, an intensification of this form of Christian life. You give up everything, which is a good work. You devote yourself to prayer and fasting and penance, which, again, works the Christian more and more into that state of grace. You might see it somewhat as exercise. If you feel a bit flabby spiritually, the monastic order is the place to be. And that context really is what is going on in part in Luther's mind. Again, he doesn't really express any serious doubt at this point in his life about his salvation, at least not vocally. He doesn't say that he was in peril of his soul. Rather, at the thunderstorm incident, he is fearful for his life in that moment, and he makes a vow, and then he keeps it. Luther will later have a very serious spiritual crisis when he attempts to do his best to be a monk. But still, it is certainly on Luther's mind that he is joining the monastery to work out his calling and his salvation before the Lord. And a number of people have seen in this something like Paul's experience. Paul, of course, in the book of Acts, the great persecutor of the early church, has a vision in which the Lord comes to him and reveals himself. He falls from his horse, stricken blind, and after that, over a period of time, Paul finally converts fully and becomes the apostle that is featured so heavily in the New Testament. However, it's not a one-to-one comparison. Luther believed that he already was a Christian. There was no sense in which he was sort of a rank-and-file pagan, or that he was somehow backslidden, or that he was corrupt and these kinds of things, and then he has a conversion in the full sense. This is a very medieval act. You make a vow, you keep it. And it's not a situation of converting to the faith, but rather a conviction, you might say, of leaving the world to do the better life, to do the spiritual life, to work out your penance with more vigor than you ever could as a lawyer. 
So if you're going to call this conversion of any kind, it's not a conversion to the faith, but rather a conversion, you might say, by Luther to a deeper awareness of the need for a spiritual life. Now, there are some other issues that we have to deal with in terms of the context here. Setting aside the spiritual issues here of Luther wanting to go be a monk in order to work out his salvation, there are some other issues at work contextually and interpersonally in Luther's life that certainly played a role in his decision to join the Augustinian order. If you'll recall, Luther had been part of the University of Erfurt. And there he had been a precocious student. Remember, he graduated second in his class in his MA in 1505. Well, one of the things that seems to be arising in Luther's mind is a real sense and a real awareness of his internal desire to study theology. During his days as a student at Erfurt, he had two mentors and teachers in particular who dramatically shaped his engagement with this world. And they were Bartholomeus Arnold, often known by the name Unsingen, and another faculty member in the realm of logic or philosophy named Trutfetter. These two men really form a bridge between Luther's previous life and his call to go be a lawyer and his subsequent decision to join the Augustinian order. Both of these men have dramatic impacts on Luther, and their impact carries on after the Reformation and becomes one of the biggest and most important sore spots for Luther as the Reformation gets going. Now, this piece is always underexplored. In fact, there's very little of it in the secondary sources. But it is dramatically important to understand what Luther is doing. You see, when Luther joins the monastery, he doesn't just join any monastery. Rather, he joins a group called the Observant Augustinian Friars. And we can't go into the backdrop too much of monasticism. But there are a couple of keys here. Whenever you see the name observant in front of a monastic order in the Middle Ages or after, that's a key. An observant order is essentially a reform movement within an order whenever that order has grown a bit lazy. The word observant here means that they're going to actually observe the rules. <laughs> they're going to actually follow the rules and do what the order is supposed to do, which is a way of distancing yourself from those who are fat and lazy. Well, this group, the observant Augustinian friars, have a pan-European influence and rootedness. But here in the area of Saxony, there was a particular wellspring of this group as a reform movement. And more importantly, the first reformer within the Augustinian friars order to give shape and laws and decrees and to become the head of this group was actually a professor from Erfurt. His name is Johannes Zachariah, and in 1492, not long before Luther came to Erfurt, he had reorganized and brought together a reform movement of this Augustinian order. And so it can't be coincidence. Luther has spent his time at the University of Erfurt. He studied with these men. He knows these men. There is this wellspring of this observant Augustinian group gathering now in this city, and its ties to the University of Erfurt run deep. You almost get the sense that just as Luther is graduating and he's coming out of the womb of the University of Erfurt and he's going into the study of law, that the influence of his teachers, who themselves were observant Augustinians, drew him in personally and interpersonally to desire, frankly, to be one of their numbers. Again, there were other monastic orders that Luther could have chosen, but he chose this new reform movement, this really intensified Augustinian group there in the city of Erfurt, and it just so happened that two of his most important and influential mentors were themselves members of this order. And one of the things that this reform group, the observant Augustinians, were really focused on was education. Now, there are lots of things that the Augustinian friars are focused on as a whole across Europe, but this group in Erfurt in particular was really focused on education which is to be expected because they are attached to a university and several of its faculty members are part of the order. And Luther is precocious, remember. He's a good student. And we should just say a couple of things about what these mentors had instilled in Luther during his time at Erfurt, which seems to be one of the things that draws him into the order. Trutfetter, in particular, was the professor of logic, and he was one of the new devotees to this view called the Via Moderna. Now, a bit later, when we get into Luther against the Scholastics, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Via Moderna. 
But needless to say, it is a relatively newer philosophy that's just come on the scene. It's associated originally with the teachings of William of Ockham, and it's really kind of a scathing, biting, kind of emperor's got no clothes move against some of the other more elaborate systems of philosophy and theology from the Middle Ages. The older model was called the Via Antiqua, and it's sometimes referred to in terms of its epistemology as teaching realism. Again, we'll get into more of these concepts a bit later. Well, Trutfeder was not a realist, and he was not part of the Via Antiqua. Rather, he was a nominalist, as they say, and part of the Via Moderna. And he inspired in Luther a desire to really engage critically with the philosophies and the theologies of the past, just as Occam had before, and just as many in the Via Moderna did. More importantly is the influence of Usigen. Usigen was a rich thinker, like Trutfeder. When he was teaching his students, when he was teaching Luther, he stressed that they should question overly simplistic answers. Now, he didn't instill in them just sort of radical doubt, sort of cynicism. But he did say, don't simply take answers at face value or simply because some great thinker has said it. Question whether or not they have said it incorrectly or if they've said it too far or whatever it might be. And Usigen was well-respected, very well-respected, both at the University of Erfurt and beyond. There is the movement of Northern Humanism, for example, which is associated loosely with people like Erasmus and others. And Usigen was respected by the humanists. He was considered to be a good, rich, deep thinker. Well, both of these mentors, both of these teachers, are there in Air Force and they're part of this order. And it stands the reason that Luther is drawn to be around them more, to go in more deeply into the study of theology. Because during the quadrivium, during his time studying for his masters as he's laying the foundation of his study of the arts, the study of theology itself was actually not a subject that was taken up. Again, theology is considered to be an advanced subject after the Master of Arts. But he gets just enough, just enough philosophy, and of course theology would be discussed here and there by students of all ages, that there was sort of this tantalizing drawing of Luther to realize that if he comes back to Erfurt and if he joins the Augustinian order, he can engage in theology, he could be back with his mentors, and he could, in essence, follow his heart, you might say. And there are other folks there as well. The Augustinian order was really drawing others. For example, one of Luther's lifelong friends and his partner in crime, you might say, a man who would go with Luther to Wittenberg, who would become a professor there, and who would be one of the shapers of Lutheranism, is a man by the name of Justice Jonas. Well, Jonas himself was roughly Luther's age. He was a couple of years younger. And just to show that Luther wasn't the only one sort of caught in the siren's call of the Augustinian order, Justice Jonas comes to the University of Erfurt just after Luther. He comes in 1506, and he too is a lover of humanism and Erasmus. In fact, later, he would be a professor of Greek and other languages. Well, Justice Jonas, as a student, follows a nearly identical path. He studies at the University of Erfurt, And then, drawn in, he joins the Augustinian order as well. And the story of Luther and Jonas' friendship would be legendary. And just to give one more little wrinkle to show you how much Luther cared and was committed to these two mentors and to the Augustinian order, we need to look ahead a little bit. After the posting of the 95 Theses and the eruption of the controversy surrounding Luther's revolt, really, against the Catholic Church, Luther didn't write Erfurt or his two old professors off. In fact, during the earliest years of his controversy, Luther spends an inordinate amount of time writing and in one case traveling to the University of Erfurt to meet and attempt to win his professors over to his side. For example, in 1518, Luther attempts to go and see Trutfeder, and by this point Luther is well known as a rebel, and he arrives and Trutfeder sends his servant to tell Luther that he is ill. And he wasn't ill. This was a brush-off. Trutfeder seemingly felt a bit betrayed by Luther, that one of his students had now become this sort of renegade. And Luther writes a real impassioned piece that he sends to Trutfeder, in which he says, amongst other things, that now he realizes that the learning and the teachings of Aristotle were, quote, a waste of time. This is a real shot. This is real painful for Luther to admit. And... Frankly, from that point on, he and Trutfeder were intractable enemies on either side of the Reformation. 
there is this sort of painful sense in Luther that he is betraying men whom he'd followed from the University of Erfurt into the order. And to write his old professor and say, in a nutshell, that everything that I studied with you is a waste of time is really an indication of the ripping of their relationship. The situation is worse with Usigen. He had a little bit more of an influence on Luther. And, in fact, they had a number of interactions together face-to-face. Again, just after the Reformation, there was something called the Heidelberg Disputation in 1518. And Unsigen was actually present there. He came for the debate. And as we'll see in a later lecture, the Heidelberg Disputation is really the coming out party for Luther's more radical statements on grace and justification. His views were somewhat piecemeal or halting in the 95 Theses themselves, as we'll see. And Unsigen had come to the Heidelberg Disputation. And the two of them had traveled back together to Erfurt. And along the way, Luther says in a later letter that he attempted with all of his might to persuade his old mentor and friend to join him, to see his views. But he is turned away. Unsigen simply will not come with him. And Luther later admits that Unsigen is an, quote, obstinate old man. And again, the relationship is ruptured. And in this case, Usingen even takes the fight back to Luther. Several years later, in 1522, Unsingen delivered a number of sermons championing traditional views of ecclesiastical authority, which was the crucial issue for Luther in his fight against Rome. His denial that the papacy had authority over doctrinal matters was really the linchpin for all of his other arguments. Luther's old mentor and friend stands up for the traditional Catholic Church, provoking Luther to write a number of serious blasts against his old mentor. And there are a number of stories like this. But what we need to know is that following this thunderstorm moment, Luther personally and spiritually felt a call to the monastic life. And we take Luther seriously here when he's talking about his desire spiritually to become a monk and that he is following his vow. We really shouldn't let cynicism creep up too much and see it simply as self-serving. Still, Luther's call to the monastery was not 100% entirely about saving his soul but rather there was the added benefit of reuniting with his mentors and his teachers. And as we'll look at in later lectures, the theology that he begins to study and learn at the University of Erfurt becomes the bedrock of the issues that Luther raises first and foremost in the Reformation. He drinks deep of late medieval theology, and after his move to the University of Wittenberg, away from his old mentors, After he has his break and his Reformation breakthrough, Luther turns back and the two men who shaped his young life now become his enemies. Okay, that's it for this lecture. In our next lecture, we're going to be looking at Luther the monk. Just what in the world happened that drove him nuts? What actions of penance did he perform? Why did he become depressed and angry and bitter? And we'll discuss his next great spiritual advisor, Johann Staupitz. (laughs) 